Hello and welcome back once again to the only coast to coast radio show in the US of A that's all about the information economy. It's time for Inside Analysis. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh here. And folks, I am very excited to have, a, frankly, a legend in the industry with us today. We're going to be talking with Michael Berthold. He is the founder and CEO of a company called Nime. That's spelled K N I M E. And they are an open source analytics and data science platform, a visual platform for doing data science, which is good stuff because even though there are lots of people who can code very well, almost anyone can look at visuals and move boxes around on a screen. So that's what they figured out. So with that, Michael, welcome to Inside Analysis. Tell us a bit about yourself and Nime and what you folks are working on these days. Thanks. Thanks for the invite, Eric, and having us on the show. Um, as you already said, NIME is very much about visual programming, low code for data science. And we started that many years ago as a platform really for as a workbench almost at my group at the University of, uh, University of Constance to be able to kind of deploy our research results to the real world to practitioners wanting to use that. And it's grown from there to become a, one of the only open source visual data flow platforms for doing anything you want to do with data. And I mean, I kind of, I'm always a little bit careful about calling it data science because that often scares people because they say, oh, I just want to do data wrangling. I don't care about the sciencey bits and that's kind of scares them off. And that's what NIME does as well. So a lot of applications that we see in real life is just in large airports, just getting data in the right shapes from many different sources. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I will tell you, I'm a huge fan of open source. In fact, we built a website a number of years ago, and we feed it with a technology that we built called Media Lens, and it's called Inside Open Source. And uh, the reason we launched it was because I realized there's so much happening in the open source world. There's the Apache Foundation, there's the Linux Foundation, there are lots of other projects outside of those organizations as well. But in the origin of open source, I found fascinating. So I first started researching this in 2005, when I was working for the Data Warehousing Institute as their web evangelist, and uh, Katrina had just struck New Orleans. I just moved out of New Orleans, so we watched it all happen on TV. Uh, it was just, of course, terrifying. But I remember that uh, the senators from Louisiana asked for a quarter of a trillion dollars to rebuild southern Louisiana. And I happened to know through a past life and past clients in the government space down there that the politicians are good at making money disappear and I thought to myself, this is a very bad situation because if all that money just floods in, it's going to flood right out, not where anyone intended, and a lot of it is just going to disappear. So I went on this high horse, if you will, and started doing research, and uh, it took me to open source. And I, I put forth this theory about open source government, about publishing all the government data such that citizens can see where the money goes and understand. And I basically said, look, with the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act in the States, which came out of the Enron debacle, corporations had to document their processes for how they come up with their numbers. They had to be very transparent about that stuff. And I thought, well, if corporate America has to do it, why doesn't the government do it as well? And people thought I was crazy. But uh, one, a couple things happened that were amazing. One guy paid attention. Out of 40,000 people I emailed, one guy paid attention, and he worked for the Heritage Foundation. He went and talked to – he basically testified to Congress and said – we can have citizen auditors. This stuff really can happen. And he really leveraged the imprimatur of TDWI. And sure enough, they did it. House passed a bill. Senate passed a bill co-sponsored by a guy named Barack Obama, who was a senator for Illinois. And then President George W. Bush, believe it or not, signed the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act in September 6, 26, 2006. And I almost fell off my chair. I was like, wow, they actually did it. But the reason I bring this up is to talk about the power of open source and I realized at the time, the Apache web server had just surpassed the Microsoft web server as the number one web server. And I thought to myself, well, that's very interesting. And I was also studying service-oriented architecture at the time. And I thought, well, if you have all this open source code and you have a service-oriented architecture, you should be able to plug and play and sort of take stuff out and put stuff in and have a very composable environment. And I thought, well, that's not going to be very good news for the SAPs and the oracles of the world because they like the monolith. They like control and they have control of all, all that stuff. And it took longer than I thought, but about 10 years later, open source just blew up the market with Hadoop and with uh, Kafka. And of course you have NIME. So, so tell me a bit about the open source foundation of NIME and, and what drove your decision there and, and what it means for your customers. 
Um, that's a very interesting story. I didn't know about that uh, open data movement coming from, from Katrina back in the old days. Um, so NIME is a bit atypical in its open source models. I mean, fundamentally, there are really three different ways to do that. You can have distributions like Linux, and you're essentially making money by packaging them up nicely and supporting them. But essentially, there's not really new code that you're adding around it. Not quite true. I mean, they all have little installers and that type of stuff, but that's fundamentally the idea behind distributions. You can also have what people often refer to as open core, where you have something that you open source, but it's kind of, it's more of a teaser. It's more baitware. And if you really want to use this in production, you have to buy some commercial bits and pieces around it. And then you have, of course, also the MongoDBs that are essentially databases, that type of stuff. Also, maybe even a database with Spark, they have really cool open source technology and they make it accessible to you in the cloud uh, for charge. Time is different in that we have one open source piece, that's the analytics platform that allows anybody who wants to, to build these workflows and execute these workflows and pretty much do anything they want to do with data. And then we have a um, commercial complement software to that, which we call the Nine Business Hub, which allows people to productionize that and collaborate. So when you have more than one person using the analytics platform in your organization and you want to deploy that as a web interface or a REST service, or you want to collaborate, and have compliance and governance kind of features, that's when you buy the hub from us. Um, and the reason the open source platform is open source, um, the open source analytics platform is open source, is not I'm not too religious around it. But to me, it's in the data science field in particular, you can't exist with proprietary software. There's so much cool new stuff going on on a daily basis in research groups and other types of environments that you're essentially standing on the shoulder of many, many giants. A lot of functionality inside NIME is actually based on open source libraries. So it seems kind of unfair almost to put that into a proprietary umbrella. And also it enables us to be fair to get in inroads, make inroads into academic to into teaching environments much easier because they can just use the open source platform for teaching. But it also we have both open source contributors that are contributing additional functionality into the Nyman Analytics platform. So it's really I'd like to see it as a win-win situation. Also for our customers, because they essentially get a lot of maintained functionality from us. In addition, they have access to all of those community functions out there. Yeah, that's very cool. I mean, there are a lot of good things about open source. One of the things I've heard over the years is that bad code goes away because all these eyes can see. Now, the, the one shortcoming I've come across is that the open source project gets to MVP status, if you will, minimal viable product, and then doesn't typically go past that just because it works now. We just kind of move beyond that. But what are your thoughts about about that in particular, about um, how you make sure that you have truly finished products and that you're able to deliver robust platform analytics ongoing for all of your clients like what how much effort does that take internally from your developers to, to stay on top of the platform and make sure everything's working that's a very good point i mean i tend to joke that 99 percent of all phd uh, phd projects turn into open source projects and then they kind of die away and fiddle away and never really turn into something useful in production. Now I'm a, probably about half of our development team, we have like 80 developers at Nine. are focused exclusively on the analytics platform and just making sure that core works and, and works in a professional environment. Um, we have our own extensions, which are of course maintained by ourselves. So we have the same quality assurance there. We have what we call trusted community extensions where we're in close collaboration with the community contributing those extensions. So we can also make sure there's quality assurance there as well. And then there is, I'd call it the long tail of extensions that are experimental, right? The nice thing is that everybody can use those and play with those and explore new technologies. And then when we see increased usage of some of these experimental extensions, we can move them into the trusted extensions as well. Interesting, that makes a lot of sense. So you're trying out things, you've got these, extensions and trials basically and then once you see there's a lot of activity then you throw some developer support behind it to harden it is the term we typically use right to make it sure that it's bulletproof that it really does what you want it to do etc no that, that makes a lot of sense and you do end to end nime does everything from data ingestion data pipelines number crunching model building all that kind of fun stuff is in the nine analytics platform is that right Yes, that's true. So we have everything from about the ETL part, loading the data, we can access about 400 different data sources. 
We can access databases, strange file formats, Excel, of course. We can also execute bits and pieces on different execution environments, like doing the ETL directly inside a database or in Snowflake or in Databricks or in Hadoop in the old days. Um, and then we go all the way to visualization via the analytics functionality. And a lot of that, as I said before, is of course based on e charts for the visualization, a lot of Python libraries, C libraries, R libraries, Java libraries for some of the machine learning functionality. We have integrations with TensorFlow if you wanted to do that. We have integrations with the other deep learning libraries. We have integrations with XGBoost. Pretty much everything is in there. Um, but the other pieces, so often when people talk about end-to-end -end data science, they only mean this kind of from the data to the report or to the endpoint or to the model. But the business hub then also covers the rest of this journey, right? Deploying it to others, managing it, retraining models when needed, um, and monitoring their, their performance. Well, right, because at the end of the day, you want these algorithms to connect into your business, whether it's for marketing exactly. or for manufacturing or supply chain or whatever it is, you want it to affect some outcome in the business. And so that involves connecting to operational systems, right? It involves connecting to ERP systems or CRM systems or things of this nature. That's where the magic happens. And a lot of times that's the hard part, right? I mean, I've heard many stories about models that just don't get deployed because maybe the company just didn't have the wherewithal or they didn't have the expertise to do it properly. But being able to plug the algorithms into operational systems and then monitor how those models perform and switch them out, right? Because you've got your production model and you have your challenger models that are sitting at the, by the wayside waiting to get pulled in and being able to switch over to a new model when a model that's in, in production starts faltering that's that's a critical piece. And that, I guess, is that done in Business Hub with you folks? That's done on the Business Hub side, exactly. So as Business Hub, you can deploy models, which really are deployed nine workflows. You can uh, deploy them as a REST service or as a web application, and then people consume it. And you can constantly monitor um, what, what's happening in production and then potentially replace, retrain, or just alert the data science team and just say, hey, this is so out of whack with reality. We don't really know how to fix that. Do something about wow. it. The nice That's thing is fun. that you don't have to switch code in between, right? In the old days, it was always somebody coded the model, it was trained in some strange language, and then it was reprogrammed by IT into some production language. On our case, on the hub side, the workflow that was trained is also the one that runs in production. That's interesting. So uh, one of the other hurdles that people are running into is when they use Jupyter Notebooks to write their model or to build their model, to test with data, and then they want to go put that into production. And it's just this step-by-step -step tedious process of copying over code and values and all these things. And that falters often. That, that from what I understand, is a really serious problem. But I guess, do, do you not have that challenge because you're not using the Jupyter Notebooks typically and people are just in the environment, in the analytics platform, building out their models after they pull in their data, et cetera. So you're, you're already production ready when when the process begins is that about right that's a that's a very nice summary yes so what you use what you use on the creation side when you actually train the model is exactly that piece of the workflow gets then moved into production and executed by exactly the same engine so you don't have also have a translation issue there the other piece right. that people often lose in this going from training to production is all of the feature engineering that you did all of the feature transformations that you tend to lose them so you only can take the model and move that in production, but you can't do the transformations. And in NIME, you can grab automatically the part of the workflow that has the transformations and the model, uh, applying the model, take that, grab that automatically and deploy it to NIME Business Hub. Wow. That's pretty cool. And you cover all and sorts so of different industries, right? So it's you, you do insurance, healthcare, I would imagine, financial services, all sorts of different industries, because it's more of a horizontal solution. Is that about right? Yes, that's absolutely true. We have customers and users in pretty much every industry. Yeah. Well, and we're going to talk about large language models here in a minute in our next segment. But uh, before we get there, I'll just throw out one of my theories to you and, and see what you think about this. To me, this, this explosion of AI through foundational models, including large language models, is really a major call to action for organizations to get their data house in order. And what I mean is that data governance, if you don't have data governance, if you don't even know what data governance is from an organizational perspective, you're going to have a hard time responsibly leveraging 
AI. Would you agree that companies really do need to take a very hard look at their end-to-end -end data management life cycles, processes, understand governance, who gets access to what data, even understanding a, a broad inventory of your data sources? Would you agree that is paramount to do that before pulling the trigger on some AI? I totally agree. And the funny, in a way, it's funny that we've been preaching this for also data science processes for a long time, right. this government's right. topic, and nobody really cared. And now people right. really care. They're waking up. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? I mean, I just, I've been in this business a long time. I've been talking about data governance, analytics, AI, all this stuff for 20 years, right? And uh, we talked about data governance 20 years ago and 15 years ago and 10 years ago, and basically nobody was doing it. I mean, yes. you couldn't even, it wasn't even easy to do because you could either control access at the database level, which is hard, access controls, or at the application level, but there's nothing in the middle. And really it's in the middle. And now with the cloud, that's one of the nice things about the cloud is that it is this de facto marshalling area for functionality and data. And now we have the capacity to apply very fine-grained controls on things, on data sets, on types of data, for example. We can scan and find PII and then know, okay, flag this as sensitive. You know, there are lots of things we can do these days that we just kind of couldn't do 10 years ago. Real quick, one minute, what do you think? Is that about right? We, we finally can do this stuff, and so we are doing it. What do you think? Mm, I'd probably explain it slightly differently and say we could have done it probably before as well, at least some of those aspects, but people just didn't care enough because there was not enough harm in it now. But now that everybody who does anything with Gen AI is in the danger of sending data anywhere, people are really, really waking up and, and seeing the, the pain there. That's right. Well, it is, like I say, it's a call to arms. It's a call to action. And Absolutely. the organizations have got to do it because you don't want to wind up uh, in the crosshairs of an audit. You don't want to wind up with a breach. You don't want to wind up getting sued by someone because their information has now been leaked to sensitive uh, to sensitive resources out there. Well, folks, don't touch that dial. We're talking all about AI and analytics platforms. And next up, we're going to dive into these large language models that are just taking the business world by absolute storm. It's really quite fascinating to watch. But uh, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. You're listening to Inside Analysis. All right, folks, back here on Inside Analysis, talking to Michael Berthold. He is the CEO and founder of a company called Nime. That's K-N-I-M-E. Look these folks up online. An open source analytics platform. It's wonderful stuff. It's like a giant candy store for analysts to go play and have fun. But I want to talk to you about these large language models, uh, Michael, and in particular, first of all, the open source side of the equation. So Meta comes out with Llama and Llama 2, open source. OpenAI used to be open, now it's not. Now it's the uh, ironically named OpenAI because it's a black box. And with the technology this powerful, I believe we need we need open source. You know, I, I don't know that I would get behind a mandate that they, they must be open source, but there needs to be some transparency into how these things are working just so that we can have our, you know, our peaceful sleep at night to know that uh, there aren't bad actors involved somehow. I mean, certainly for regulated industries like financial services, if you bring it into some workflow for loan approval or something like that, then you have to be able to explain how you came up to your answer. But what are your thoughts in general about open source versus closed source with these large language models? Um, I think there's a there's a lot of value in it. The problem is that the, in, in my opinion, there's open sourcing large language models isn't just about open sourcing the code, but you also need to open source how it was actually trained. So in a sense, you also need to at least give open access to the data that was used for training. Because even if I give you a model and it was trained on half copyrighted material that it's going to spit out again when you use it, you wouldn't know if you didn't have access to the training data. Right. That that right. part of that is, is was it supposed to be used? Um, right. And then I think the other piece is that what some companies are open sourcing is only the code to use the model for predictions later to actually apply it. You don't still don't know how it was trained. So that's the third element that needs open sourcing. And then I believe one of the key proprietary ingredients that a lot of these companies now have is safeguarding code around it so that mm -hmm. some types of answers don't get produced, some types of inputs aren't being accepted. 
and open sourcing that as well would really, really reveal their secret sauce. And I think that's why they are, the open AIs of the world are shying away from that one. Right. No, it does make sense. I mean, we have proprietary code. It's not new. But again, these are very, very powerful engines. And then th there's another whole side of this equation, which is the RAG model, retrieval augmented generation, which upon great reflection, I believe will be the layer of functionality for governance, for privacy, to a certain extent for security, for management. You know, a lot of that's going to get baked into the RAG model where you could, for example, before you hit your prompt, before your prompt goes up to the large language model, have a layer in between that checks and sees, okay, and this is already happening. Like I asked um, Gemini a couple of weeks ago, how many electoral votes are in Georgia and uh, Arizona and some other state? And it thought for a second and said, oh, elections are complex and fast moving. We recommend you use Google. <laughs> that, <laughs> did that is quick. a guardrail. That's a guardrail. They exactly. really built that in to say, no, 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 we don't want to touch that. Right. And that's in the RAG model, right? That's not like trained in the model. That's outside the model, but it's, it's the workflow you have around the engine. That's very, very important. Right. I, I totally agree with that one. I mean, that's what I called the safeguards before. And I think sometimes it's probably not even part of the context that's part of the RAG models, but it's really part of some safeguarding code even around it. I mean, we use that at NIME as well. So we have built in what we call Kai inside the analytics platform that allows you to have a QA mode. You ask questions, how do I do this and this in Excel? How does that look in a NIME workflow? And then it gives you, shows you a couple of nodes in NIME. And we're, of course, filtering that these nodes do actually exist. Because every now and then OpenAI, which we use underneath the hood, hallucinates and invents nodes that Nine probably should have, but we don't have it. And that doesn't help the mm -hmm. poor user at all. Right? That's a very, very simple way of code around the Kai that is just making sure that what it spits out is reasonably useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and interesting. And, and you're going to see more and more of these AI agents, that's what everyone is talking about now, are AI agents, which are like little bots, semi-autonomous bots that can do various things and they can check on each other and they can do all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's very interesting to, to me when we talk about data science, we talked about it before, it all seems to be getting subsumed now into AI and conversations about AI, even though there are lots of different versions of AI, right? I mean, there are traditional models, regression models, like all sorts of old fashioned AI, if you will, that's still very powerful and still works. But uh, the new stuff is is sucking all the oxygen out of the room. Isn't that about right? Yeah, we see that as well. And sometimes, I mean, I'm an old guy by now. I've seen this in the past, right? When back propagation came along, everybody was suddenly using gradient descent for every problem. We just thought, hey, you can solve this directly. You don't need to do gradient descent. Then it was support vector machines, and then it was somebody else. And now it then was deep learning, and now it's AI. So sometimes we see people building workflows for where for even very simple things, they're reaching out to some AI. And we just say, hey, there's a node in Lyme that does that. Computationally, a lot less expensive if I don't use that. So I think to me, it's it's a bit of a hype right now. It's just a new kid on the block. Everybody wants to play with it and use it. But uh, augmenting, really mixing it and matching it right with traditional techniques, I think that's where the true value lies. Yeah, well, and so I'm just guessing here that one of the nice things about your platform is that it is an end-to-end -end platform for building models, designing models, training models, pulling the data in, all these things. And it's adjacent to this business hub. So you you have a marshalling area for ideas and for testing algorithms and for testing models. Then you connect it through the business hub and see what happens and see how it, how it operates. And, and it's important to have this one environment where that takes place because when you have multiple tools, it just takes longer and it's disjointed and there are connections between the tools and things change. So it, it's important to have that that main marshalling area to have your, your, it's like a giant analytic sandbox. Is that about right? That's a very nice description, absolutely. I tend to say that a data scientist doesn't necessarily need to know how the method does something, but it needs to know what the method does. So if it's reaching out to a Python library or an R library or a C library underneath it, it's not that important. But you still need to understand what, what the method actually does um, underneath the hood to be able to interpret the results. Mm -hmm. Simple example, if you don't know what a regression coefficient is, you won't be able to interpret it. But mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need to understand how it was derived from the data. Yeah, no, that, that's very interesting. Let me throw this concept at you and see what you think about it. I, I wrote up an article just last week, I guess, 
about this, I was flying to a conference in Denver, just thinking about these large language models and analytics and AI and all this stuff that I've been covering for a long, long time. And I thought to myself about this concept I call the executive cockpit. And the idea is that I think very forward-looking organizations are going to deploy a small language model that is aligned with their business, like if it's manufacturing or healthcare or whatever, on their data in their data center, so on-prem, possibly in the cloud as well, but I, I have my thoughts wrapped around this on-prem small language model. Then you're going to train it on your ERP, on your Salesforce, on your CRM, on your customer support, for example, your tickets, like any of your core enterprise systems, you're going to train this model on your data, on your business, business data. Then what you'll do is set up Kafka topics coming from those systems into a vector database adjacent to this inter interface for the small language model. And that is where the executives will spend their day running their business, because then you could ask any question at all. How is our marketing working in APAC? Uh, who, who can we let go if we have to save some money? What, 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 where are we weak in our organization right now? Just all kinds of different questions, and you'll get all these answers. And I actually mentioned to a CEO of this uh, one company, because I was trying to get him to help me do sales enablement for them, because I have this big audience I've been marketing to for years, and one person turns out to be uh, the next uh, deputy chief data officer for the IRS. And I sent this email saying, hey, this is a lady I've known for a long, long time. This is what I mean by sales enablement. Do you guys have the IRS account? And he fired back. He said, I don't know. I don't know if we have those accounts. And I thought to myself, well, you would know if you had the executive cockpit, because you would just ask it, do we have the IRS account? Who is the account rep? What's the latest in this account? Because you're getting information from all these systems in your private environment. But what do you think about this concept? Is that is that doable? Is that pie in the sky? Or what do you think about all that? It's an interesting idea. I thought about similar. I mean, at the end of the day, you're personalizing an, a large language model around your own infrastructure, your own, own in-house data. I think the challenge there is that in order to get a really, really good model like that one, that's really useful you need to train it on a lot more data than just your own. So in a sense, you need to benefit from your competitor's data without actually seeing that, but kind of learning the general structure and the general insights, and then you customize it on your own, which in return kind of means that you should also be providing your data to other, other organizations. It's almost like that's kind of pre-competitive training of, of these models so that they're useful for everybody. I think oh. just training it on your setup you need some more bigger context than that. Or maybe you're a second company and you have enough context anyway. But for every small company, I don't think you have enough data to really get meaningful insights. That's very interesting. That's a good that's a that's a good point. Cause I'm just I'm I'm wondering to myself, and I'm gonna throw this one at you too. So one of my aha moments with these large language models was when I realized that when you train them on a corpus of data they're not actually persisting the data verbatim. It's not like they're taking strings of text and storing it in a record somewhere, but rather in the training process, that data you use will adjust the weights and biases and the parameters of the model. So in other words, it's like, huh, well, that's, that's very interesting that it can, can train in that fashion and then reflect back to you such remarkably granular detail about things. And, you know, what I've seen is that if there is a subject area that has been published about widely, like how computer processors work or how an irrigation system works, anything that has a lot of, of content on the web that these engines were trained on, it does very well. It knows all that stuff. It's when you get to the fringe of where there's not that much published. And I guess that's kind of your point about having enough data to train the models. If you don't have enough you're not going to get the contours right and it's going to be skewed in one direction or other. Is that about right? I think that's a very good summary. The contours is right. I mean, a colleague of mine once summarized and said, essentially, it's a consensus engine. It's getting right. the consensus around what a computer programming is, learns right. that from the data and can repeat that. But if it's just one isolated outcome, it's probably not going to be able to recall that one. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, Craig Schmidt Huber, I think his name is. Uh, he's the guy who wrote the papers on the Transformers, and mm -hmm. he's based. Uh, I guess he's actually in Saudi Arabia these days, but I want to say he's uh, he's German, of German origin. And I was amazed when I realized he wrote those papers in like the 1990s or something. And it's just just now we have the compute to be able to. Could you explain that? Is that what happened? Is that the, just the timing was right now to be able to understand this and put it into 
display because that was one of the big changes. And now it's able to see like, you know, 10, 12 tokens left or right as opposed to just a, like two or three. And you also have this, like you say, like a consensus, right? Where So there are like, I call it almost like an AI Greek chorus where one is saying, I think it should be an A, I think it should be a B, I think it should be a C. And then the exactly. goes, okay, I'm going to pick this one. That's very interesting. It's a very interesting development. But why do you think it took so long? Is it just because we now have the compute to do that? I think it was a compute power issue as well. And then some science tends to have a little bit more of an needs a little bit of time before it truly has an impact, but it was mostly waiting for compute power. I don't know that one one way of looking at what this consensus really does is I don't know if you watch these YouTube videos about JetGPT playing chess. No. And the interesting part is that at the beginning it does extremely well and does very sensible things. And part of that is these opening libraries are all over the place. Right. So that's extremely well-established consensus. Hmm. And then somewhere in the middle, it starts inventing bizarre moves and suddenly new figures pop up on the on the board out of nowhere, right? And it has always meaningful explanations for that. And the problem there is the that that data is so sparse that there's no consensus to learn. So at the beginning, it sounds it almost looks like it understands chess rules. But the only reason it does follow the chess rules is that they're so deeply ingrained in all of the common material that you see. That the kind of the likelihood of going outside of the rule book is too small, but somewhere in the middle of the game, it goes completely off the books. It's interesting <laughs> that's, to see. that's wild. So one of my good friends in the business uh, is a gentleman named Usama Fayad. You may have come across him at some point. He was the first I'm... chief data officer for Yahoo way back in the day, and now he runs the Institute for Experiential AI over at Northeastern University uh, here in the states. And I had him in the show, and he's very funny. He's very candid. He said, these large models, they're they are too big. They're not supposed to work. They're, we don't know why they work. I'm like, what are you talking about? This guy who runs this whole operation, he's joking. We don't even know how they work. I mean, how's that for transparency, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some truth, right? We don't really know how they come up with these answers, right? It's a, it's a wild mix of it. It's a highly distributed model. We don't know why a particular answer comes. We can come up with kind of proxies for an explanation by wiggling with the inputs and trying to figure out what happens. And we can say, ah, this probably had a lot of influence on the decision, but we don't know for sure. That's so wild. I mean, that's just yeah. such a big deal that, you know, but we do. So now we have all this observability in the data space, right? You've got Data Relic and Data Dog and or New Relic, I'd say data. All these different companies are doing observability, which I think spun out of Kubernetes primarily. But it's very interesting, and we need that kind of observability in these large language models, I think. I think that's going to be one of the keys to success. But folks, uh, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. We're talking to Michael Berthold from NIME on Inside Analysis. Stand by. All right, folks, back here on Inside Analysis with Michael Berthold, founder and CEO of NIME, K-N-I-M-E. Look them up online. And Michael, I was mentioning to you in the break, that I'm, I'm wondering to myself, this whole business intelligence industry, and there are hundreds of players these days, hundreds of companies doing some form of analytics. Of course, NIME is a whole analytics platform, an open source analytics platform end to end, but there are lots of point tools, whether it's visualization or number crunching, OLAP, ROLAP, all this kind of stuff. And I wonder, is all of that in the crosshairs of these foundational models? What do you think? That's a very, very interesting question. And we, of course, asked ourselves that as well. And I think for some of the for some of the tools that you mentioned, like generating visualizations, that type of stuff, I do think they are pretty replaceable by AI type models, because at the end of the day, you're doing something, you're generating a code that generates a visualization based on data, and you judge the output of that code by just looking at it and saying, this isn't quite right. So I think that type of stuff will go away. And we have in NIME actually a built in what used to be an e-chart scripting editor that has now an AI element, and you don't need to touch the code anymore. So those right. types of things, will, I believe, will go away. BI tools trying to really find surprising, interesting new insights in data. I think that type of stuff is a lot harder to replace because fundamentally you're trying to find something new. And like we discussed before the break, these Gen AI models are consensus engines, right? So they, they kind of try to gravitate towards something they've seen more and more often that's before. Very interesting, that's right. That's an excellent so, point, really. That's that's exactly right. So it's it's good for understanding 
the, the well-trodden path, basically. Like, that's what it's very good at doing is saying, okay, there's a highway that goes that direction, but I want to go wandering around in the forest, and it's not as good on the fringe, basically. So you you will use it. But, I mean, I, so I read an article, uh, some guy on LinkedIn talking about how he connected, I don't know, by ODBC or JDBC or something, <clears throat> his his model with data sources, and he asked it to query the data source, and it did. It reached into the database, pulled the information out, and delivered it. And you're like, okay, that's pretty interesting. And then when I think to myself about what's what could be happening here is, you know, in the data warehousing space, for example, we move so much data around. It's all the data that's the, from your core systems that you've decided to put in, which is a tremendous amount. Very little of that data ever gets used. A lot of times it's the it's the summaries or the aggregates or the roll-ups that are, are used for various purposes, but a lot of it just doesn't even get used at all. And I think that what these large language models are going to do is kind of turn the entire model inside out of how we viewed moving data and analyzing data and doing things with data because they don't, they don't really care. They're just going to, once they're trained on a certain space, and again, if you train it on your data or with your, in your vector database, you have a lot of embeddings of your corporate data and you point your RAG model there, well, you can get answers to things very quickly that before would have required running reports and doing ETL and doing all this stuff. And I think that in many use cases, these, these models are going to short circuit all of that stuff, and you're just not going to have to do as much of that stuff anymore at all. But what do you think about that? I think there's some truth to it because fundamentally what these models won't necessarily do is actually look at all of the data, but they're going to apply a lot of common standard practices to that. And standard sounds a little bit too limiting. I think there's a, there's a huge wealth of standard practices that people do apply to the data and that's part of this consensus engine. And so the, the AI models will try out a lot of those things a lot faster than you ever would. Right. So absolutely. And there's a good chance that some of these insights that will gen be generated are interesting to you. Mm -hmm. But then continuing the exploration and saying, I mean, what, how do they always say the, Eure the Eureka moment is usually uh, pre preceded by, oops, that's strange. Huh. And I think I you'll have that. these I'm moments, like right? And AI doesn't do that. AI doesn't say, this is weird. I should dig in a little bit deeper because that's outside of the consensus. So it will continue doing kind of, like you said, will will continue the normal path. That's and that's where I believe the human um, intuition, curiosity, <laughs> oops detection capability is going to be relevant for, for a long time. I like this, oops detection, that's good stuff. Well, there was a gentleman I had on the show years ago who did something, he said something a lot like that. He basically said, AI doesn't have to be the ability to be like, hmm, that's kind of weird. What's going on with that, right? Because it's just processing information and doing what it's been told to do, which is just reflect back words based upon a prompt and it's training. It's a very simple thing. I mean, it's very complex in terms of how it got there, but nonetheless, it you know, it, one thing that did annoy me, I will say, is in the early days when that New York Times reporter was getting deep with the with chat gpt and trying to like tease out of it whether it's sentient or something i'm like dude that is a misuse of the technology like that is not what you should be using this thing for to try to like what trick it into revealing that it's really alive I and mean, what you know what are you even talking about and I, I think that's part of the 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 downside these days is that and i'm a media person myself but a lot of times the media will just sort of glom on to some narrative about something and it's very hard for them to decouple from that and and get down to brass tacks and that's what we do in the show in fact i used to say at the beginning of every show the show it's all about getting down to the brass tacks of what actually happens in the data world and what you do with this stuff and i think it is important that people keep in their minds the purpose of this technology why are you using it where is it appropriate to use it and where is it not appropriate to use it and that's just basic common sense right yes i totally agree i mean it goes pretty much in line with also the European AI Act that they just passed. But I mean, if it's not mission critical, if it's not safety critical, you can trust a system that is wrong in, I don't know, 0.1% of all cases. If it's controlling nuclear power plants, better not be wrong in 0.1% of all cases. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You got to watch out where it's... So wh where do you see a lot of use case of your clients? I mean, obviously, some of your clients are using large language models. Where are you seeing success stories in, in that space right now? 
Um, so there's a lot of success stories in other areas of the business, as you probably probably know, undoubtedly know, right? Checking legal contracts, doing marketing material, that type of stuff. There's a lot of value in applying Gen AI on the data analytics space. Honestly, we don't we see a lot of interest. There's a lot of people that say, "Oh, cool! I can build a customized jet chatbot using Naim." That's not really our core business. And then the real applications tend to be around text processing, which is where Gen AI is really strong. And we then, instead of using outdated antique libraries for sentiment analysis or text segmentation, you're just handing it over to an AI model and say, "Hey, segment this or extract the key components or create a summary." But that type of stuff, it's amazing. So yeah. these. I see Nime also has image mining extensions. I think that's the, the next setup where we can use image processing capabilities of Gen AI. For a lot of the number crunching, I mean, we've all seen these cases where it can't add two numbers, doesn't really know what a prime number is. It misses the understanding of, of what the concept of a number, right? So there, I think it's more as a, as a tool to help you build um, workflows, build mm -hmm. data sets but only as a helper. Right. So that's actually an excellent point I wanted to, to get into. I believe that we're just scratching the surface of using these models as a component in a workflow. So you mentioned, for example, summarization. That is hugely powerful. I mean, yep. you know, you, you can enter, like, especially for policies, for complex policies, for law, for example, for legal pr protocols and when to file motions, what motions you can file, what you have to do according to, I mean, you used to have to pay lawyers a lot of money to tell you that stuff. Now, if you just get access to the rules, load them into a large language model and just start asking questions, that is an incredibly powerful use case because it used to take a lot of time to sort through the process of how to do something. Now you just ask it, how, did, how do I fire someone? First step, send them a letter saying they're not performing properly. Second step, you know, monitor their behavior. Third step, all this stuff, it's like, there it is. Like, wow, talk about saving time. I mean, it saves time. And here's my other big uh, soapbox issue. It improves morale because nobody wants to spend their time scratching their head, reading through just dreadful documentation. Nobody likes doing that. Nobody. So all that stuff is going to go away, right? What do you think? I, I totally agree. Yeah. Your, your examples center a lot around firing people, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I tend to say when people ask me, is Gen AI going to make data science lives easier? I say, no, I don't think so. But it's going to make it nicer because it's going to remove all of that boring stuff. And we can now focus on the really interesting, but more complex stuff. So it's going to make it more interesting, more complex. That's interesting. Yeah. Wow. And I think you do want to document things and you can have it document things for you too, right? You can just throw a whole bunch of stuff and document this. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, we, we now have a component on the hub that takes a nine workflow and explains what the nine workflow does. And we do that by just shipping it off to Gen AI. It's perfect for that. Wow. That's amazing. All right, folks. Well, podcast bonus segment coming up next. You're listening to Inside Analysis. All right, folks, back here on Inside Analysis, talking to Michael Berthold. He is the founder and CEO of Nime, K-N-I-M-E. And uh, Michael, I know what it's like in a software company. There's always a roadmap. You're always working on something. And uh, we talked about a couple of key things, governance. Uh, there's model governance. There's data governance. There's IT governance. What are you working on the, in the governance space? <laughs> Thanks for asking. That's like, like you know, all the roadmaps are changing all the time. Um, but what we're currently working on, we've had actually this model governments topic on the roadmap and have been working on that for a couple of years now. So the idea of being able to monitor what models are doing automatically, retrain them, we talked about that in I think the first episode. Um, but what we added now is the ability to also govern the AI usage of people that are creating nine workflows. So first of all, when somebody is creating Nine workflows using the Nine Analytics platform and uses this built-in AI, we call it Kai for Nine AI, um, we need to make sure that gets channeled to an IT-approved AI, right? Maybe that's just for expense purposes. You don't want to have too much consumption in the cloud, want to make that in-house, or it's really a data privacy issue. But the more worrisome part for people is that you, I mean, one of the strengths of the Nine Analytics platform, the workflow concepts, is that everybody can use any technology they want, right? They can reach out to experimental libraries, they can reach out to R stuff, to Python stuff, to whatever. But by now, they can, of course, also connect to various different AI providers. 
And we need a way for them <clears throat> for central IT governance to be able to make sure that the nine workflow users inside the organization organization can only use approved AIs. So maybe they, maybe marketing can use an AI in the cloud, but maybe legal shouldn't or HR shouldn't. Hmm. Right. And that's something we have built in into the nine hub now that we can limit the types of AIs you can their users can reach out to from the Nine Analytics platform, mm -hmm. and they get to choose from one of the approved AIs that IT central IT set up and said, "Okay, here's an AI that's consumption light, that's for the easy tasks. Here's the one for whatever the tech team. Here's the one that's for compliant data." <clears throat> and we also allow the setup on the hub side of safeguarding workflows, so that you can before the data gets sent out to say a cloud. AI provider, it gets screened for private information, or maybe the data automatically gets anonymized before it gets sent out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very important stuff. And the 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 use, are you also able to do some fin ops on that? In other words, see how much it's costing to leverage this AI engine versus that AI engine and do some cost optimization. Is that something you can do? Um, we can do that as part of a nine workflow, and you could put build that. You could build that in there as well. But we are currently offering to our customers the ability to monitor consumption, so they have a bit of an eye on that. But it's not automatically rerouting to different AIs. But that's just a added functionality under the hood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all in the workflows basically, and that's where we're going in the last segment, where I think that we're just at the beginning of leveraging these technologies because what they're really very good at is pattern recognition. Right, even just the vectorization, the embeddings, basically how it stores it as a, it's like a point and array, basically, and just understanding how it can map those two things. It's not just word, not just text generation. I think we're going to get some really interesting things in terms of pattern recognition and then recommendations. I mean, I think that these little AI agents, these assistants, are going to be extremely helpful in all facets of business. You know, to be able to to very quickly give you a customer profile when you're on the phone with someone or to be able to give you summarization of, of text on demand. I mean, really, I think the hardest challenge is going to be changing mindsets and changing day-to-day -day behaviors and workflows. What do you think? Final thoughts? I, I totally agree with that one. We see that inside Nime as well. I mean, the developers were the first ones that really said, we want to use this, we want to use this. But then getting the rest of the organization to also seriously think about it, it's like, what can HR do? What can legal really do with that? It's a huge time saver and it's largely untapped. I totally agree with you. There's a gigantic, it's very, very, there are interesting times ahead. Yes, to, to say the least. Well, what a fantastic conversation, folks. Look him up online, Michael Berthold, B-E-R-T-H-O-L-D from NIME, K-N-I-M-E. We'll talk to you next time, folks. You've been listening to Inside Analysis. Thank you.